Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram and SoundCloud at VMSPod, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Virtual Memories Show, and on Tumblr at Virtual Memories Podcast.tumblr.com. You can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit Patreon.com slash VMSPod and set up your level of support. Every week, you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Beer of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. I had a two-day trip to Orlando last week for a trade show. Um, not particularly exciting. It was Orlando. I did not bring my podcast gear with me. I could not think of any authors or other interesting people in the Orlando area to record with. Um, I will note, this was the first time in almost 20 years that uh, somebody at a, an event said, Oh, so you're Gil Roth, and not in a good way. Um, last time, almost 20 years ago, it was a cartoonist who was mad about a review I'd written in the Comics Journal. Um, this time, it was a little more complicated than that. I have um, I have done some things in the, uh, the, the past couple of years in my new job that have made some people unhappy, but made my constituents very happy. Um, for the most part, people on the other end of things understand that business is business, Um at the same time, you know, I, I guess it does help to, to build a reputation, you know. Now, speaking of reputations, this week's guest has that in spades. Her name is Jessa Crispin, and this is her second appearance on the podcast. Uh, Jessa was the founder of Book Slut, which is one of the preeminent book blogs, um, well, I guess of the, the, the new millennium, which is a terrible term to use. Uh, when we spoke in 2014, Jessa was just stepping down as editor of Book Slut, and she closed it down for good last year. Um, but she discovered that uh, doing an interview about closing down Book Slut, uh, she made some what she thought were innocuous comments and observations um, that they actually came off as, as firebombs thrown at the publishing world. So... Like I said, she's she's got a bit of a reputation. Um, I do chalk that up less to Jessa's attitude and more to um, everybody else in publishing being kind of thin-skinned, I guess. I could say that for my, my non-publishing perch. And maybe other people have different experiences with Jessa, but we've talked twice uh, that time in 2014 and this one, and they're both pretty light, entertaining conversations by my standards. So anyway... Uh, Jessa has a new book coming out. In fact, it is out today, if you're listening to this the day the show gets released. Um, it is called Why I Am Not a Feminist, A Feminist Manifesto, and it's published by Melville House. Now, based on that title and subject matter, you could say, geez, Gil, why would you kind of uh, approach that and you're a guy, you don't really um, fit in here. So I will cop that, yes, I dug the book, but and I say it during the episode, I don't think I'm qualified to judge it exactly. Um, I just don't have the perspective. Uh, there are degrees to which, yeah, everything is universal and blah, blah, blah. But there are also degrees to which a female experience um, culturally is just radically different than what I have as a, a framework. And um, and she addresses that in, in the book also. I mean, yeah, I, I guess... I could try like picking into the logic of her argumentation or something. Um, but that's, that's like a technique people use on the internet to invalidate another human being without actually like engaging and debating them just because they don't have a completely airtight rhetorical system built up around them. I'm not saying uh, Jessa doesn't. I think it's a very good book and a very well reasoned one. Um, but it seems like she wants engagement and debate and, 
Um, I think this book should engender that at the same time. Oh, engender. Sorry, I shouldn't have used that. Sorry. Uh, but anyway, I think it's a very good book. Um, but your mileage may vary, especially if you're a woman. Uh, I will say that it, it provided me with some perspective, I guess, on the, the systemic challenges women face and then that marginalized women face as opposed to women who are more um, assimilated and powerful ultimately in the system. Um, it did sort of validate my feeling that the quote unquote, and I'm putting this in quotes because I'm the only person who's ever quoted it. Everything is feminist because I'm a woman and I say so vibe is a sort of empty construct. Uh, feminism should mean more than being all inclusive, I guess, or at least inclusive in a way that turns out to kind of perpetuate um, the existing power structure. I won't say patriarchy, although I did go to Hampshire and I, I could have majored in patriarchy, I guess. Um, although major is a patriarchal term. Anyway, the book is not overly prescriptive, which is what I'm getting at. Uh, it's very descriptive. It's, I think that's for the best uh, in terms of trying to delineate what her, her perspective is and where maybe to begin moving forward, uh, what you can do. But she doesn't have a, a line of marching orders or anything like that. I really dug it. Um, especially as a companion to Jess's first book, The Dead Ladies Project, which I read a few weeks earlier. Um, that one I, I really enjoyed. And we get into a bit of a conversation about it where I sort of misread it and she straightens me out, uh, which is one of my favorite aspects of doing this show. Anyway, that's enough of my rambling. Um, the book is Why I Am Not a Feminist, A Feminist Manifesto from Jessa Crispin, published by Melville House. Pick it up. Give it a read. Also pick up The Dead Ladies Project. There's one caveat about this show. Actually, it's two. Um, and that's the the ambient noise. There's some street noise outside. There is a minivan that tries to drag race down the street. That's kind of interesting. Um, there's also a neighbor who decided to vacuum for a while. Um, I tried to clear out most of the, the ambient noise, but, you know, you'll put up with it, right? Anyway, here's Jessa's bio from her website, jessacrispin.com. Jessa Crispin is the founder and editor of the magazines Bookslut.com and Spoliamag.com. She is the author of The Dead Ladies Project, published by the University of Chicago Press, and The Creative Tarot, published by Touchstone. She has written for many publications, some of which are still in existence. She has lived in Kansas, Texas, Chicago, Ireland, Berlin, and other places. She currently lives nowhere in particular. And now... The 2017 Virtual Memories Conversation with Jessa Crispin. Well, it's funny that um, you posted on Twitter about the other one, and I was like, yeah, that was before any... Now I have three books. Or four. Well, that's actually my starting point here. Yeah. It's been two and a half years since we talked. Yes. And you published three books in that time, yes. and I feel like a goddamn slacker in comparison. Yeah. So was that intentional? You're just uh, to make me feel bad? Yes, it was. It was how how can I how can I cause the soul death? <laughs> <laughs> and you've you've succeeded. Although, um, to be fair, you also had to to bail. You chose to bail on book slot and and spolia. Yeah. So you know yes. you're, you're slacking also in some way, right? Uh, well, we're still, we still do spolia. Oh, you it, do? It, well, okay. it, sporadically. Um, you know, I, we stopped doing it monthly, um, and then I missed it. So we brought it back. Um, so now it's when we can get around to it, you know, um, our managing editor, uh, Corinna, um, was like, oh, I'm going to go teach the German language to Syrian refugees, so I don't have as so much time on my hands. I was like, you, you you're so sell, selfish. You selfish bitch. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we, um, we're, we're taking our time, but we're still, we still do it when we can. Cool. Two and a half years. What's changed? Um, Besides the three books, and we'll get to the three books. Um, well, now well, I live in the United States. <laughs> You call that living. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it, a kind of accidental uh, re-entry into American culture. And now that, you know, and, and I decided, I know that I didn't want to live in um, New York that much longer. And I'm still planning on leaving, hopefully within a year. Um, 
but I wasn't sure if I was going to be leaving the States again or just moving somewhere within the United States. And then the Trump presidency happened. And then I was like, no, okay, I'm here. I'm here. Like, mm -hmm. this is not a time when you leave. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so that's, so that's, a, that's new. <laughs> mm -hmm. What would keep you out of New York or what drives you out of New York? I don't like it. The city, the state? I don't like the, I like parts of the city. Mm. Um, you know, I'm not within the city and I thought that that would be able to keep me here longer, but I don't like, I don't like the writing culture there. Um, I find that hard to believe. I, that's a big change for you. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. No, I will um, tell you, that was one of the realizations I had over the course of, uh, in the span since we've talked, um, the sorts of guests I actually like sitting down with. And I, I characterize it for someone as a 30-year-old with a first novel who went to college, MFA program, and then it's been working in publishing is not someone I have any interest in, in no. a conversation with. No. So, yeah. And if you're surrounded by that or if that's the sort of person who's, you know, you need to be in touch with, that's that's got to suck for you. It's not good. It's not good for your morale or your vision of what life is like or could be like. Mm -hmm. um yeah so i just i just prefer i just prefer to leave so i'm I'm going to be leaving hopefully soon country or or no i'm saying oh, you're I'm saying, saying country a, yeah, right. throughout yeah, yeah. The, however long it takes um however long trump is president um or you know this administration four or eight years so we'll see mm -hmm. where are you looking at going oh that's secret okay Understandable. I have room in my garage if you need. It, it's okay. <laughs> it's, not, it's not quite that bad, you know. Yeah. Although I should ask the uh, before again we get to the books, your library. Uh, last we spoke was uh, ensconced somewhere in Berlin. You've, yeah, it was you've, in a storage unit. You've rebuilt. Um, well, I, I got it back from the, my books back from the storage unit. So yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Do you find yourself accumulating more books or able to keep equilibrium? Uh, well, the goal is to only ha I have three bookcases and I'm, the goal is to keep it to three bookcases and that's not, it's not the situation at the moment. <laughs> um, but that's the thing. Like I, I try very hard to get rid of as many books as I read. So, um, so we're, it's, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing effort. Yeah. 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 Uh, actually, which is something we didn't get to the first time and as you're approaching 40, do you, uh... Thank you very much. <laughs> so you've canceled your life's project and you're approaching 40 years old and you have no home but what no. the um the process of deciding to get rid of a book how difficult is that for you at this point oh, you'd already no, gone through it in the past but you know is there a sense of of i'm never going to read book x or i'm never going to read book x again or well, have like... you always been unsentimental no, I've always been very sentimental and I try to fight against it. Mm -hmm. I try to fight against sentimentality. But after, you know, I spent a year and a half on the road and you carry your belongings on your back for a year and a half, mm -hmm. then you get really fucking unsentimental very fast um, because it hurts. So if you can get rid of a book, this is less pain. Uh, so I became very unsentimental about, oh, I finished this book on the train. I'm leaving it on the train, you know. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of still how I try to do things. Cool. In the first book that you published, mm -hmm. Dead Ladies Project, mm -hmm. you've got a passage about Stravinsky, mm -hmm. uh, in which one of the phenomena about his, his work is that there's almost no continuity from project to project. Each one is, is sort of a self-contained and unique. It, it doesn't carry any of the, the traces of previous ones. Yeah. Do you see that in your own work? No, not at all. Okay. You no. see a, a, a major Jessa running through all three? Well, I feel like all three are involved deeply in the same question, which is how do you be a woman in the world? Um, and they just take very different approaches to the question. I hope to find a different question. Um, and it, I mean, the, it's funny because, you know, the tarot book and the, and the, Manifesto were not necessarily intentional projects. The Dead Ladies is very personal. And the idea was mine, and it was definitely what I wanted to do. And then um, the Tarot Book and the Manifesto were suggested to me. And that's a different, it's a different thing. Mm -hmm. And so coming out of um, the Dead Ladies project, the there wasn't enough 
time maybe to formulate a different question or maybe I was still obsessed with the question. Um, and so they turned out to be part of the same. To me, they're of, they're like a set. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe that's just because they were all written within like a two year span of time. Do you recognize who you were at that point versus now? Oh, sure. Okay. Was there an evolution or an answer into that question? Um, I mean, there, it's a question that I kind of ask myself every day, um, particularly now, <laughs> politically, um, it seems like an important question. I um, should, should note that we're recording the day after the inauguration. Yes, um, yes. And apparently every other woman in the country besides you and my wife um, are gathering for marches. Yes. Um, are you not a marching person? Or does that fit into the manifesto in terms of what... Well, what, when we talk about the manifesto itself. Sure. Let's talk about the manifesto. Do you feel you were being pushy or shrill? Or I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> <laughs> and this... <laughs> I have a knife underneath my chair, just in case. I yeah, need. let me just cross off that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but talk about the, yeah, I know. <laughs> lean in. Mm. Um, can you talk about the genesis of it and what your your what your perspective was? As uh, a guy, I just don't feel like I should be the one, you know, sort of sort of summarizing it. For well, you. it's funny because you know I was talking to my sister last night. We were having dinner. Um, and I was like, this is the first man who's interviewed me about this manifesto. And I wasn't sure how it was going to go. If I was going to have to kill you in it. And she was just like, I went just to Hampshire, try, well, try I went, not to. I went to Hampshire College in the early 90s. So, um, yeah, a lot of the exaggerations of political correctness mm -hmm. were, were kind of inculcated oh, okay. in those, those few years that mm -hmm. I was there. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm coming from a, a weird guy perspective. But, yeah. but yeah, can you talk about, again, where it begins, what the, the core of your piece was? Uh, so it began with, um, you know, uh, for years, I was somebody who was known as being a feminist book reviewer, right? So if, the, if there was a feminist book, I was asked to review it, right? Mm. Um, and this happened for years. And a lot of anger builds up <laughs> to, in that if you are basically asked to uh, review garbage, um, a lot of anger builds and frustration and confusion and one night I was having a conversation with my publisher and it just turned into this full-blown rant about uh you know the latest my latest feminist encounter and uh and they were like you should write a manifesto you should write a book for us about it so um that's that's actually how that well, happened was it a drunken rant at all or oh yeah it was oh, three martinis okay. and a steak in so nice you know. okay. gin fueled rant. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's what do women ask about it versus what you are well, what you don't know whether i'll ask um well, I've had a couple of interviews and they've all been very different, um, you know, but the general uh, theme is what should we do? What should women do? Mm -hmm. Like the book is kind of more of a um, criticism than a guide book to now, now what's no matter what do we do. It's more about uh, the problems with this moment in time rather than, you know, my answer, yeah. <laughs> my gift to the world of how now we should all behave and what we should think, you know. Um, so there's been this question of like, okay, so then what do we do? Um, and my go-to answer of you should live a life that is in alignment with your value system doesn't go over super, super great because yeah. that's, um, that requires that you know what your value system is. And a lot of people, I feel like a lot of people don't in this moment in time. Um, you know, we used to get our values from religion. We don't anymore. If you get your values from the culture, you know, we just, um, elected the epitome of our culture, which is competition, greed, objectification, um, and so you can't really get it from the culture. So then where does it come from? 
And I think that's actually a struggle. Like, do I just value my own comfort? Do I value my own um, place in the world? Do I value some sort of, you know, larger participation in, in community and politics and so on? Um, and what would that look like? And I think people are actually really struggling with that right now, mm -hmm. particularly women. Yeah, it brings up something that even when I was a kid, um, the thing that struck me as odd about feminism in one incarnation was... Oh, this will be, this will be good. You uh, as... Oh, no, this, this is uh, in keeping with what you, you wrote. <laughs> yeah. The idea that we want to be able to fuck up as badly as men fuck up is not an adequate goal. And that, that yeah. you know, as a kid, that struck me as you really shouldn't be trying to get equality to screw people over the same way yeah. guys screw people yeah. over. That's not, you know... I mean, that was yeah. the whole watching the Hillary Clinton thing. It was just mm. like, really? <laughs> this is the best. This is a feminist success to be as bloodthirsty as men. Yay us. Let's go team. <laughs> you did vote for her. Uh, did you vote? Um, I shouldn't ask that. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask in the primaries or in the election. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you're not at the Women's March. It's not because I, I don't support it, and it's not because I'm not a marcher, because I've definitely marched in the past. It's, uh, the, in this particular instance, it's logistics. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Since I was on Twitter earlier and saw hour-long delays at the metro stations in Washington leading up to this, I kind of figured it's, it's you know, kind of an enormous um, influx. What do you hope people or women get out of the, the book? Simply that that attempt at trying to, to suss out their own values um, and what it should mean? Yeah. I, well, I don't know. Is that my job? I wrote the thing. I stand by the thing. Yeah. How people interpret it and take it is up to them. That's their job. Mm -hmm. It's out of my hands now. And and not to kind of, you know, uh, refuse to take responsibility for whatever, because I take full responsibility. But um, I have no expectations and I think because it didn't, the idea, it didn't originate with me. I don't have that sense of um, uh, personal attachment that I do with the Dead Ladies Project. It is kind of just like throwing a bomb into a crowd. And then it's up to you what you do with that, <laughs> with that experience. <laughs> and last time we talked, the whole question your assumptions vibe was, was you know, significant. Um outlook of yours or yeah. perspective so if that's what we're we're pushing for that sounds pretty good along with lack of ambition is key to success that was one of your uh your, yeah. your statements back then is that yeah. held up is oh that a, yeah of course okay Absolutely. just just complete dearth of of you know you know every time i've wanted something it was stupid every time i decided oh this is what i want it was a bad idea <laughs> every time i was like oh that guy i totally want to date that. I was, uh, okay so um or, you know, this is a job that I want. Mm -hmm. And then I see, and then I don't get it, thank God. Or I do get it, and then I immediately quit. Um, or I see, you know, how the career uh, plays out of the person who did get it. So I've just, I've just accepted the fact that I'm an idiot. And that I don't know what I want or what's best for me. Um, and so um, I just let things kind of happen without too much, um, getting too much in the way of it. Sounds advisable. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean to sound like a Buddhist because I'm not, yeah. <laughs> I'm very, I'm not detached in any way, but, um, but as far as careerism goes, yeah, that's, that's really what you're, would you say you're disengaged from that aspect? Yeah. I try things? to, I try not to, because I'm just bad at figuring out what would be best for me. So mm -hmm. I, I come to terms with that. Has your relationship to the internet changed? Um, Particularly post was it antagonistic slide. last time? <laughs> Is it ever not? <laughs> so no, it hasn't changed. If that's... <laughs> uh, post book slut though, um, post, you know, publication book slut. Is there a, do you find yourself, you know, either engaging book culture differently, engaging with, with you know, other you, forms of media? I mean, you know, what happened was um, I gave this interview uh, with Vulture that people took very badly. And um, I thought I was just saying the things that I've always said. And that is true. That yeah. These are the things that I've always said. But for some reason, now maybe people listened or because the platform was bigger. I don't know what it was, but people freaked the fuck out. And, you know, um, were tagging me in Facebook posts to, let, to make sure that I saw that they were calling me a fucking bitch. 
Um, and so, yeah, I do, I feel after that, I just like, eh, nope. I feel very much detached from a, even more than I used to from that whole, from that whole existence and scene. Um, so I guess part of my thing about, I don't have any expectations for how this book is going to go. My only expectation is that people are going to call me a fucking bitch and I'm going to try very hard not to see it this time. Okay. Don't go to Goodreads. <laughs> 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 you know, like I have this thing where I wrote an essay and then there were all these bad comments that I didn't see, but then people would tell me what the comments were. Like, oh, did you see the comments saying that? Oh, no, I didn't. And why would, why would you tell me that? Like, yeah. why does everybody need me to know that they think I'm, you know, that people in the world think I'm a bitch or a moron or whatever? Like, I know that. I know that in an abstract way and I can deal with that. I don't need to see it in a specific way. Yeah, I am. Um... Having recorded a conversation with you before, nothing in the vulture thing <laughs> struck me as as odd. So it was sort of surprising yeah. to me that it did, you know, you achieve know, that level of. Uh, I I left that interview thinking that I had been boring. Yeah. And then you realize you criticize the Jonathans. Yeah, and and, and I thought you know they're, they're never going to run this interview. Like it was so boring, and then it, and then everyone freaked out, and then I left the country, and then I didn't care so much. <laughs> you did have one line that I do want to call you out on, though. That was a. Uh, I think dark thoughts all the time. I just keep them to myself. Sure. I, I think that's bullshit. I think you, you really do let most of them out. But, you know, maybe they're even darker than you normally talk about. No, the darkest ones. They get screamed into a pillow. They don't, they don't get oh. voiced. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it cool that I read Dead Ladies Project more as a novel than a, a memoir? That it was sort of a character? Not not that you were faking, you know, or creating a persona, but that it was, to me, it, it seemed as though I was following a character through this um, journey of sorts, or at least this, this we'll just say geographic journey, not soul journey or anything oh, like that. Jesus. Um, yeah, I was not going to go in any sort of new age pathy kind of way. Thank God. But, you know. um, well, what do you mean by that? They have a sort of narrative sense, or even an experimental narrative sense. Um, all right. I don't know how to take that, or what to do with that. Um, it wasn't a memoir. It was a memoir. Okay. How is it? How is it not a memoir? I, I was up in the air about it. I, I'm not entirely because it's not enough of your life, I guess. It didn't have the, the factuality, I guess, of, of most memoirs so much as the immediate environment and the the book. I loved it. Don't get me wrong. It just seemed really uncategorizable to me, and I found myself enjoying it more the way I enjoy a, a decent novel. You know, I think it's kind of funny that. Um, when something new comes around, you get a lot of like wild experimentation. So memoirs from before, let's say 1980, before memoir became its own category, when mm -hmm. they weren't even sure how to, uh, label it. So you get an autobiography or, you know, whatever essays. Um, it didn't have, um, it was a wild territory. P writers experimented, they did weird things. And then when it became popular and it became like a, a, um, part of your career path, there became all these rules and expectations and form that had to be there. Certain things have to be there. And I remember reading a couple, um, reviews before I learned to stop doing that, um, where people were like, well, she doesn't, um, give the information that's expected in a memoir. I was like, well, why does, why do you feel like you need that information in order to, you know, what do you think somebody complained that they didn't know what, um, age I was or something like that, or what month it was. I was like, why, how does that help ground? Why do you need that? Can you just make it up in your head? Like, you know, um, so I found that interesting that people, they come to a memoir with certain expectations. And if you do something else, then, then they, they, they complain about it. Um, but to me, it wasn't any different from like, um, I'm trying to think of like, you know, Molly Haskell's love and other infectious diseases. When I, I read that when I was 16 and, and it kind of blew me away. Um, Jeanette Winterson's autobiographical work, like it, it didn't, it didn't conform to expectations because those expectations weren't there yet. And I don't give a shit about contemporary memoir. Like there are very few memoir written in the last 20 years that I find in any way interesting. So I'm not going to go by somebody's rules if I don't think those rules are legitimate. 
cool. And that's all I need. The, but you're conscious of the fact that it was something that required more imaginative engagement. Um, maybe that's that's all I, I you know, I will, you something know, I ascribe to, to novelistic sense. But you know, I, I wrote the book that came out when I started writing. You know, and I didn't come with um, like an like an overarching idea of what my yeah. what the project was. It's just like, I'm going to write this thing and we'll see how it turns out. And then this is the way it turned out. So, yeah. Do you think about parallel cities or writers that you would have approached in this? Um, you mean people that like got cut out? Conceivably. Or, you know, afterwards you think about, you know, if I was doing Dead Ladies too, ha ha. <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> <laughs> um, almost everybody made it in that I wanted in. The only person that, um, I mean, there were some Paris writers and artists that I thought about doing, but I didn't want to write about Paris because there's yeah. no expat experience has been more uh, overly ex explored than, um, than Paris. So I just, just didn't want to do it at all. Um, and then Robert Graves in Mallorca was the only, was the only person that I thought that I might do and I wanted to do. Um, but I wasn't ready to tangle with his particular misogyny, you know, um, and it, I just didn't feel up for it. It just felt boring, maybe. So, yeah. Okay. So I was wondering if there were, you know, parallel paths and, and other cities or other, other lives you would have gone into or your own in, you know, other aspects of it, but... I know I'd read in an interview, I think you'd had a couple of trips to Budapest during the, the process, but it didn't make it into the, uh, right. Yeah. The there was, well, there wasn't anybody that, uh, I particularly connected to and Budapest just became like my, uh, recovery place. If I was having a particularly hard time somewhere, I would just go there <laughs> instead. Um, because it was, I love it there and you can just like eat goulash and drink rosé wine and, um, have, uh, gypsy bands play for you, uh, and then and then you're better, and then you go back out into the world. Yeah. So for my one week that I'd spent there, uh, the other factor was that I was unable to pick up more than three words. Oh, it's impossible. Yeah. So you learn to gesture really effectively. Yeah. Even yeah. reading signs, though, you, usually signs, you know, eventually make sense, but nothing, nothing, nothing at all. No, the language is crazy. Yeah, which is why that I think you turned me on to the novel Metropole. Um, oh yeah. By Corinthi, uh, a couple of years ago, and. I realized after reading it that it's simply a Hungarian's experience in the day-to-day -day world because they have to translate everything into that weird finno ogric language group they've got. So. The, the first time I went there and I went into the subway system, I was like, oh, God, that book is a documentary. Like, it's not, <laughs> <laughs> it's not even a novel. <laughs> That's what I realized. It was just the flip side of what they go yeah. through you know, yeah. in the day-to-day -day world. So. Um, any city from there you want to go back to, from the, the dead ladies? Oh, I've gone back well, to a lot of them. You go repeatedly? Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure if there's anything that you, you know, look back on in a way that, you know, you either didn't capture the way you wanted to and, and keep going back to, to, to try to rewrite or, No, I'm not you know, that kind of person. You actually look forward. Go figure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> not being raised as a neurotic Jew really has hurt you a lot. Of <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need a black magic revival. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Well, we have, we're having one. I don't yeah. know if you've noticed, but every millennial woman is a witch now. So we're definitely having a black magic revival. I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. Can you talk about the role of magic and, and ritual in your life and, you know, how you see it, um, how it plays into the tarot work that you do? And again, not in a new agey kind of way. I'm just wondering what you see it as. And we've talked a previous time a bit mm -hmm. about the, narrative nature, uh, the, the creating a new story and reframing things in your life. Mm -hmm. But, um, I don't think we went into the origins of that for you. Like where did that, that perspective come from? Uh, well, I've always been a crazy mystic, you know, um, uh, I don't, I don't know if you noticed, but you passed over a line of salt when you walked <laughs> in the, in that, the yeah. house. I was having a, I was having a problem with a spirit. Um, <laughs> so, so some salt went down. But, uh, no, I've always been a little bit of a crazy mystic since I was a kid, um, and just very interested in that, but the, brought up in a Protestant slash atheist household, um, that just beat that shit out of me. Um, and it took me a long time to recover it. Um, so it plays a big role in my life, it plays a huge role in my thinking, 
um, and my writing in ways that um, maybe aren't necessarily clear on the page, but I can feel it. Um, yeah, so it, it's just, it's a, it's a part of everything now in a way that maybe even four years ago or something like that, it, it wasn't. What changed? Oh, what, yeah, what changed? Um, I think coming out as a terror reader and not being immediately met with ridicule was, uh, was important because it was certainly, um, my fear that if I mention that I'm a terror card reader, nobody is going to hire me to do intellectual work ever again, because you know, the, the, uh, the intellectual realm right now is atheist. <laughs> um, and it's very hard to have a conversation about religion. It's very hard to find, um, religion has retreated into its niche, right? So you get Christian writers writing for a Christian audience. You don't get... That was a minivan. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, uh, you don't get a uh, Christian writer explaining his perspective to a wider audience. And I think maybe um, Islam, because Islam is the other, is the... Uh, is the chosen other of our of our era that we're in at the moment. Um, like there's a little bit of that, but only in a secular kind of way. Um, and there is some interesting stuff happening happening with the pagans and the witches, um, but it hasn't kind of erupted into the larger culture in an intellectual way. Um, so so yeah, so being able to say, I'm a tarot card reader. Um, I believe in the gods, um, and not immediately be, uh, marginalized for that was, um, I think important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, um, affection, I'll say for female saints also within the yeah, Catholic realm. They're my people. Yeah. Um, despite not having been raised Catholic or having that as a... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I always used... I loved the Catholics. I, I was very envious of the Catholics. I used to sneak into the Catholic Church what to, to give you. confession and to, like, <laughs> do the cross with the holy water thing. Um, well, the theater of it, right? Yeah. Like, it's just so dramatic and beautiful. And then you have the Protestants, and they're just, like, singing songs very badly without moving their feet. And then, you know, having a potluck in the basement and making, like, those sweet potatoes with the, the marshmallow topping, which is so disgusting. Um... And that's, and that's the Protestant experience. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the, so the Catholics had so much more drama and better outfits. And then, you know, I, I'm, I'm not Catholic and didn't convert or anything. I'm not Christian. Um, but the female saints showed up a couple of years ago in my reading, um, as, this very interesting example of how do you survive a patriarchal experience and, you know, working within the confines of their culture to create spaces like babe spaces, lady spaces, you know, St. Teresa's writings on forming her own convents and ruling over convents and which were incredible, you know, like safe babe spaces. Um, whole cities um, and cultures being um, ruled by women. And there was always like a priest, but St. Teresa, St. Hildegard, they, they, they always knew how to manage the man. St. Teresa did it by, you know, she was brought in front of the Inquisition several times and she, you know, there would be, oh, you wrote this really shocking thing. And she would just be like, oh, what do I know? I'm just a woman. <laughs> and they'd be like, oh, that's so cute. And then, you know, she'd flirt and then she, they'd be like, okay, we're not going to execute you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> you know, um, but she was very cool and very managed about it. Um, and that's basically how, do, how do you survive? How do you survive? How do you create your own space within an overarching system of oppression? Um, and it, the church, even though it's terrible and disgusting, um, allowed women to become philosophers and composers. St. Hildegard was an artist. She was an herbalist. Uh, she was a composer, wrote some of the most, um, amazing music, um, of her time or any time. 
Um, and there's no way that they could have done that in the culture. Um, because if you, if you didn't sacrifice your sexuality, then if you were a sexual being out in the world, that means you were going to get pregnant and that means you were probably going to die giving birth to a child. Um, and so the sacrifice of the body in order to be a mind, be a soul. Um, yeah. And I find that actually helpful, useful information. As long as we're going on about the inauguration and everything else, where do you stand on the, uh, wow, the Trump era is going to be good for art because we're going to be <laughs> good. Okay. I'm, I assume that was going to be the case and I'm really thankful because otherwise, you know, I would have been looking at you with disdain. So, um, cause I believe the, probably the single worst thing about the Bush era, worse than Iraq and the financial crisis was really the bad art. Yeah, and, it was and, bad and, art. You know, I just sort of put that at number one, but you know, I overreact. But also, people don't understand the historical context, right? Like there was Amanda Palmer saying, "You know, I've studied German history, so I know that this is our time." I was like, "Do you do you have any idea what art was like under Hitler? Like Weimar was interesting. <laughs> um, Hitler was bad for art." Uh, a, most of those people died <laughs> under Hitler <laughs> yeah. and nothing was being published. Everything was, what you know, come on, like be a grown up, be a grown up, just confront the situation and the reality of the situation without trying to worm your way out of it with some sort of, Oh, well the art will be really good. You know, that's a child's way of looking at the situation of like, there's no bright side to this. There really isn't. This is a terrible thing that's happening worldwide. Be a grown up, look at it and then deal with that. Yeah, I seem to recall, it was back in the 80s, uh, Philip Roth lambasting uh, George Steiner for the artists in the uh, behind the Iron Curtain were much greater oh, and yeah. all this. And Roth's like, yeah, if that was the case, they wouldn't all be trying to get over here to live nice, banal, normal lives. So, yeah. you know, don't celebrate the oppression and, and brutality they live under. So, yeah. Yeah. But we've got a lot of that ahead of us for the next couple of years. Oh, exciting. Yay. Exciting, exciting. You know, uh, journalists, too. Uh, you know, this is our golden age to, you know, yeah, serve our corporate they're overlords. they such a good job. They're totally ignoring the, the Women's March. There hasn't been any um, TV broadcasting of the Women's March yet today. Um, so they're just basically pretending, yeah, no, this is the golden age of journalism. Way to yeah. go, everybody. Yeah. yeah. And we'll cover what she was wearing at the, uh, the inaugural ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a, uh, a conference in Frankfurt this fall. Where should I go that's not Frankfurt while I'm there? Any Anywhere in Germany that's not Frankfurt is good. Yeah. Frankfurt is a Yeah, it did Nuremberg hole. last time. Oh, trust me. This is going to yeah. be my third Frankfurt trip. And I'm yeah. <laughs> so I'm not looking yeah. forward to it. Uh, favorite place in Germany? Um, Knowing that I'm a Jew. Well, uh, Ber Berlin is nice. Um, Baden-Baden is beautiful. Munich is beautiful. Uh, the Black Forest in general is beautiful. Bavaria is crazy. Um, with any sort of literary thing that I'd go wandering around looking at neat, uh, uh, literary pilgrimage sort of stuff, or is pretty much um, everything. Well, I don't know. I never really did that while I was there. I was much more about, um, composers. I mean, you can, you can visit Martin Luther's house. Yeah. See, not so much. Um, <laughs> and then, um, there's like a, apparently a spot on the wall where he threw his ink pot at the devil. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so you can see that. Um, yeah, I mean, if you go to Bavaria, you can see King Ludwig, mad King Ludwig's castles. Mm -hmm. Um, there's all the Wagner stuff. Um, you know, German writers, I was only really into the post-war generation for mm -hmm. German writers. I mean, Gert, yeah, Gert is nice. Who doesn't love? Who doesn't love? Um, I'm okay knowing that most people from that era were anti-Semitic anyway. So I'm. I'm everybody you know, was. Yeah. It was the thing. As am I. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, who are you? Who are you interested in? Of German writers? Yeah. Mann, Sebald, but Sebald spent his life in East Anglia, yeah. so you know, yeah. it's, that's not a ton. Um, and man was in exile for it, so. Yeah, I keep yeah. being told I need to read Walser, but you know, well, he's Swiss, right? Oh, I have no idea. He's I was assuming Swiss. German. But, no, I think he's you know, Swiss. You got me on that one then. Yeah. yeah. See, I'm, I'm terrible with respect. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things that usually I try and look for an excuse to bring the microphones with me on business trips. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really see a lot of option or opportunities coming up. In a... Well, there are a lot of, you know, the post-war generation is great. Um, there, you know, the, the only place in Germany that Henry James liked was Baden-Baden. Um, 
You can take the waters there. The Budapest, the 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 hot springs. That was uh, the Hotel Gallard, I think, is that one that has the uh, the, the springs underneath mm-hmm. and the uh, the strange massage, uh, massage setup. You probably didn't experience that, so I'm not going to go into. No, no. <laughs> Let me ask about your history with opera. Um, oh, How did it start? Uh, what did you? I moved to Berlin. Um, yeah. Yeah, I moved to Berlin, and my friend was uh, writing an opera. I have a friend who's a composer and she was writing an opera and so she would go all of the time. Um, and then one time she invited me and it was, uh, oh, I'm going to get the title wrong for love of three oranges. Shit. It's Prokof- Prokofiev. Shit. I can't pronounce anything. I always name. screw that up. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and I, I, I said yes, because I'll say yes to just about anything. Um, Anything that I'm unfamiliar with, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, but then I was, uh, you know, oh, I'm so, yeah, it's going to suck. This is going to be terrible. It's going to be eight hours long and there's going to be no escape from it. Yeah. It's going to be, a, it's going to be a terrible experience. And put on my nice outfit and my nice shoes um, and went and it was so beautiful and amazing and funny and warm. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you drink champagne in the lobby, uh, in the intermission, and you see what everybody else is wearing. <laughs> it's just a lot of fun. And then you go back, and it was so good. And then you eat a pretzel, because they have these pretzel vendors um, outside waiting when the show was over. Um, and it was just magical, and I became addicted to it. And I just went to every opera I possibly could. So not simply the what's on stage itself so much as the whole gestalt and, it's the and, whole experience yeah. of being elevated and taken out of yourself right mm. and being overwhelmed emotionally sensually um it's just there's nothing there's nothing like the opera except for maybe catholic mass <laughs> <laughs> Had you ever considered not writing music, et cetera, but, you know, writing libretto or anything? Is it... Oh, I mean, yeah, sure. If anybody wants to get into contact with me. <laughs> well, I mean, do you have ideas? Is there anything written. you, you never thought, uh, thought of working on? No, I mean, it, it, it's hard for it to come up. I mean, and, it, and it's funny because... <laughs> it, it is not a natural conversational point, I admit. <laughs> and it's funny because, you know, in Berlin, I, I kept meeting all these um, people in the opera, <laughs> I was dating a guy who ran the opera and uh, my friend um, was married to an opera singer and then I met this other opera singer and so I, and I knew the, this opera composer. So it was weird how my life instantly became about opera when I was in Berlin, um, which one would not expect. I certainly didn't. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which, again, I, I assume there was some long-standing or pre-existing condition that, that, that no. predisposed you to that. So. No, I mean, we That's never, cool. I never, you know, there was no, there was no high art in my family. There was no visual art. There was no uh, opera. Um, it was science fiction movies and Protestant church. Don't knock science fiction <laughs> movies. <laughs> but that was, that was, that was my, um, that's my artistic background is, you know, being read Dune when I was four years old as a bedtime story. And then, uh, you know, uh, Brazil and Time Bandits and um, the Dune movie. Yeah, Gilliam um, does have a sort of operatic yeah. scope, yeah, scale. It's not the same. Okay, cool. <laughs> but, you know, um, there wasn't anything to prepare me for suddenly being obsessed with opera. Is it something you partake in in New York still at all? Oh, it's so expensive. In That's New what York. I was wondering. Is it is no, it prohibitive to? I mean, in Berlin, it was like you could get a ticket for twenty euro, um, and it wasn't a bad seat, and you could just you know you could just go, and you could take somebody who had no interest in opera, yeah. and convert them to the experience. Um, yeah, so that's that's disappointing. I mean, the approach in America is that art is for the rich, right? Um, it's prohibitively expensive. You have to be kind of nurtured into it. There's no enthusiasm for it. And the opera in in New York is very um, classic in the sense of fucking boring as shit. Like, just, oh, we're going to do this fucking Verity again. We're going to do the Rossini. 
we're going to do everything that you expect us to do, costuming, staging, everything. And in Berlin, it was crazy experimental. I mean, I used to go, my favorites were these 18th century, they would, for, I don't know if this was a conscious decision or they just decided this every time. But I would see these 18th century operas that they turned into lesbian romps. So every every character was a woman. Every and and just staged as a woman. And they were like humping each other like um on stage and singing each other love songs. And it was wonderful and beautiful. And with this delicate, you know, uh harpsichord and lute <laughs> music going on. Um, and so funny and wonderful. And, um, you never see something like that in New York. There's not that sense of play. And in Berlin, the audience was, you know, people my age and younger and, you know, millennials wearing jeggings and, you know, whatever. <laughs> in New York, the rent is too damn high. Yeah. Were you around for that guy? Uh, the rent is too damn high, dude? No, not really. Oh, I've only okay. been here for like two years. Yeah, there was a guy who was running for mayor. Yeah, uh, I remember. With, yeah, it was his, uh, his thing. Do you, do you consider writing fiction? No, not really. Okay, it was spinning off of my Dead Ladies Project, a sort of novelistic vibe, but not a not a thing? I don't think that I have the brain for it. Why is that? I don't know. I just, you know, I I know a lot of novelists and their brain works differently than mine, I think. Like, oh, I thought you were going to say you just don't like them. <laughs> oh, no, they're lovely people. Um, I don't want to be like them. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just like a different way of approaching writing. And, and you know, um, mine is I have an idea and I want to explore the idea. There's, you know, it's like a character comes to them and they want to follow the character around. And that's a different thing. And I think... Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if writing fiction from an, a place of, oh, I have this idea, I want to explore an idea, is necessarily going to create a good novel. A novel of ideas is generally a bad idea, I, yeah. I find. Yeah. So, yeah. Unless I become French and I write it in French. Then I can do it. But otherwise, it, and I don't see that happening. Yeah, is, is that a, is that a prospect like, on the horizon? I don't like France. <laughs> <laughs> what don't you like? Besides the... Um, the played outness of, of Paris, of the Paris literary experience. You know, it's funny. I say, I realize it was a <clears throat> outdated thing for me to say. Um, you know, I, I never liked France. I never really liked Paris. Um, and then I, I started going again uh, because I met Phyllis, who runs a Berkeley bookstore in Paris. And now I stay with her. And now I love Paris because it's her Paris. I love her Paris. Um, and my friend uh, Alan Writing is there. He's a great writer. Um, and I get to have lunch with him and he orders for me. In front, you know. um, and so that experience I like. But it took a long time for me to, it took a long time for me to like Paris. <laughs> and again, just loaded with too many expectations previously or, or just no, bad experiences just, by coincidence i just think it's so there's something indulgent about it i think that i do think that, that my protestant background had this um unwillingness to have fun I'm not yeah sure like you have to anymore. earn it right like you have you yeah. you can have fun but only after years of toil right <laughs> And, and you even see it, I mean, it's, and then maybe that's why I moved to Germany because they definitely have that mindset <laughs> of like, you know, I'm drinking this wine, but I'm not enjoying it, you know, cause I don't deserve it. Um, and the guilt that comes with like, you know, um, with all of that whole stuff. Um, so yeah, so French culture, I'm just like, you can't, you can't just have like a two hour lunch and get drunk at lunch. Like the, you can't. And surprise, like, you can. <laughs> so my friends who are much more French um, are trying to draw pleasure out of me. And it's like, no, no, I need, I need my <laughs> guilt. What if I never do anything ever again? And if I enjoy myself for one second? <laughs> are there other aspects of your upbringing that, that badger you like this? Or is that pretty much the core of, of you know, uh, everything that's, that's wrong? I think that's the core. But, okay. you know, the Feminist Manifesto was also like a fight against, um, um, yeah, the patriarchal upbringing um, of um, my my dad. You, know? <laughs> you can say it. Okay. I don't think he's, he's going to like not it very much. But, you know. I don't think he's going to like it. I don't think he's going to read it. Do they, does your family, do your parents... Um, Stay in touch with what you do? I don't know. Okay. I think that 
they, I mean, they do in a surface level. I don't know if they've ever read one of my books and that's fine. Um, uh, but they, they, they brag about me on Facebook, but I don't think they've ever read anything that I've written. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they used to, and we, I used to get in these long fights with my dad. And so I think in order to keep the peace, he's just decided he's not going to read my books. <laughs> mm-hmm. So was there a tarot equal Satanism vibe? In no, the, in no. Um, no, they were weirdly okay with that. Even when I was a teenager, oh, okay. but I think they were just like, unless Jessa sacrifices a chicken, like if if this if she, if while she's reading tarot cards or whatever she's not blaring nine inch nails at top volume like she usually does then <laughs> then this is fine then we don't mind. You go to New Zealand. Mm-hmm. I am. I've never been. It's uh, it's amazing. I'll send you a video of the time I bungee jumped when I was there. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, that's not what I'll be doing. Everybody <laughs> thinks that's not what they're going to do, but you know, no. once you're there. <laughs> I'm not, a thr- I'm not like a, Oh, I find I'm not either. Trust yeah. me. It was, it was one of those, but, no. but well, with, in my case, it was, I was um, 30, 31 years old and realized during this two week vacation there that um, there were maybe three people in the Southern hemisphere of the planet who could, if you said Gil Roth would actually know who you were talking about. And that turns out to be pretty goddamn liberating when, when you realize, oh, wait, nobody here knows anything I did when I was 12 years old. That doesn't matter. And, you know, and somehow that led to 150 foot, you know, yeah. I feel like I'll have a different interpretation of that experience. Probably because more people know you. You're, oh, you're famous. Yeah, see, internet famous, but, you know. Internet famous. <laughs> Book internet famous. It's yeah, it's really yeah. going down a couple of rungs, yeah, but, you know, yeah. but it works for you. So that's, that's <laughs> And again, I'm, I'm. Some schlub with two microphones famous. So, um, One of the things, by the way, from uh, Dead Ladies, uh, a quote you had about, or in your Margaret Anderson chapter that I'd, I'd wondered how it informs you and what you do was um, just the line, without some sort of compensation, there's only so much of your soul to pass around to others. Yeah. So about making an audience and, and or building an audience and actually um, getting some sort of compensation, how do you... How do you feel you've done that? Uh, how do you feel? How do you reconcile those things? I guess without any sense of you know pandering to an audience, so much as being who you are and trying to to you know at the same time commune in the way that a, a writer and an audience, a writer and a reader do. Yeah, I mean, I guess when I talk about compensation, I wasn't. I didn't necessarily mean... Oh, and you qualify it. I'm sorry. Money. I don't mean to cut right. you off, but you yeah. said, you know, uh, either money or respect or yeah. honor, I think. Yeah. yeah I can't. It's in here somewhere. I've got the book right <laughs> here, as a matter of fact. No, that's a black magic quote. Hang on. I, I, uh, you, could say, you could say all you want. I am doing this for the 16-year-olds in Indianapolis who are starving mm-hmm. for beauty, but without some sort of compensation like fame or money or respect, there's only so much of your soul to pass around to others. Yeah. She got the respect part? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, right now I feel like I'm in a good place where for the most part I am just working with people I respect and that I like and that seem to respect and like me. But it's in a very sort of, um, it's in a shell, right? Like I, I, I started writing for The Baffler and I... I've always loved that magazine, um, and I deeply respect uh, Chris Lehman, the, the editor in chief, and uh, Lindsay, my the managing editor and the woman who um, who edits me. Um, and there is a respect there, and I feel like that's a different kind of writing that I'm doing for them now, and I'm learning something from them. And so right now, I'm kind of in this process where I'm working for. You know, in books like it was just me in the audience, right? Mm. And um, for a while, that was a lot of fun. It became less and less fun as I as it went along. And by the end, it I didn't. I felt like I was so alienated from the wider literary world um, in that I didn't. Um, have the same values as them. I didn't have the same approach to life as them. And so it just felt like the, you know, like the crazy lady in the grocery store yelling, (laughs) you know, um, and, uh, I didn't, I didn't like being that person. 
And so now I'm in a situation where I'm working with editors and publications that I feel like I'm actually learning something from them. And so the audience, like that is less important to me. Like how the audience takes the work is less interesting to me than how my editor takes it. Um, and that will, I think, pass and something, some new dynamic will come, but this is what's feeding me right now is, um, I feel like I'm improving. I feel like I'm, um, expressing ideas that I maybe kept myself from expressing, um, because I know I'm backed up in some way, um, by, by these editors, um, when it was just me, um, when it was just me on the blog, I wasn't going to talk about, you know, my, my mystical experience. <laughs> but now you realize there's nothing to lose. Yeah. Right? No, I mean, you know, but that's, it's different. It's different when there's, when there's a support system that, and it's not just you flashing, you yeah. know, the passersby. Mm -hmm. Is that a sense of a, a, we'll say gatekeeper, that sense of not validation, like, oh, now they believe I'm a real writer, but... Again, a sense that things should pass through some checkpoint, um, or is it more um, like you said, having them behind you and really supporting? I think it's more of a behind and also above, behind <laughs> and above. Like I'm trying to <laughs> impress them, answer. right? Like I'm, yeah. I'm actually trying to impress them. I'm trying, um, and it's not just um, the Baffler, but other um, places that I'm writing for right now, um, like the University of Chicago. Uh, my editor there. Uh, Susan, um, that, that relationship has become very important to me. Um, and passing ideas through her and, you know, just talking about everything. Um, so yeah, I feel like there's more, um, institutional support, but it's not, you know, for a long time getting rejected by, um, you know, the mainstream publishers <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to touch my books um and 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 so on and the the big publications that would never hire me that leaves you to believe certain things about yourself and maybe that you're the you know the, the lone voice in the wild and crazy person in the grocery store and all that kind of stuff um and so then finding alternative routes you know doors that were open that i didn't even see as existing um, in the past. That's been important. And being able to disengage from New York. I mean, I know once upon a time, it's the center of publishing, but you know, yeah. is it as critical at least for what you want to do? Um, I don't know. I, I've been here for two years and I'm glad that I had the two years. Um, you know, um, I, I managed to marginalize myself. Um, while I was here and I was gone a lot because I travel a lot. Um, Some would say compulsively, but go on. Yeah. <laughs> now it's not like, oh, I have to get away in the same way that I felt when I moved from Chicago to Berlin. Um, like I, I have to escape something from my life. It, it's just, uh, you know, this isn't, this isn't the right, the right setting for me anymore. Um, so it, it doesn't feel like, you know, I, I just don't go to those parties <laughs> and thank God I'm not, uh, you know, invited to most of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I ever get invited and Amy's busy, you'll be my plus one. <laughs> no, I promise. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll subject you to it. <laughs> I'll skip out early. And please don't do that. Last question. Uh, when we spoke in 14, you mentioned uh, a quote from Arthur Kessler about how uh, in your hour of need, the book you need will find you. Mm -hmm. Um, Anything in the last two or three years that, that, you know, sort of got dropped on you from heaven? Oh, Havel's, Havel's letters from prison. Yeah. Um, right after the election. Um, you know, and it was just, you know, um, in the used bookstore. And I usually hate letters. And so I don't know why I bought it. It was just like Havel says, so like, oh, you know, it was $5. Let's buy it. And then I just sat around for six months. And then right after the election, it was just like, you know, it was, might as well have uh, flashing lights on it. Um, and it just became vitally important. And it's still, I still go back and, um, and reread sections. So yeah, definitely Pavel. And, um, I know you, the book is just coming out now, but, uh, next project. Um, it's a secret. I figured. <laughs> 
you know, but that said, we should get together more often because you may end up putting out three more books <laughs> in the span. Of God, I two hope years. not. I really hope not. I really hope to have some time uh, to work on the next book um, and to just disappear for a while. <laughs> I'll leave you to it. Jessica Crispin, thanks so much for coming back on the Virtual Memory Show. Thank you. And that was Jessica Crispin. Her new book is Why I Am Not a Feminist, A Feminist Manifesto, published by Melville House. I enjoyed it, and I really dug her first book, The Dead Ladies Project. I haven't read The Creative Tarot, but I did buy a copy for my wife, and I'll, I'll let you know what she thinks. You can check out Jessa's work at her website, jessacrispin.com, and also follow her on Twitter as The Book Slut. She does a neat, semi-regular email, sort of about the tarot stuff, and that's via tinyletter.com slash thebookslut. You should sign up for that. Uh, also from her site, you can um, sign up for and, and order a tarot reading. Uh, she does those in person or by Skype, and there are a couple of options um, I'll just say this is not the let me tell you your future sort of thing. Uh, my wife actually got a reading um, after Jess and I finished the podcast, and she said it's really been useful in terms of creative approaches to her photography and the, the art that she makes and the work that she makes. Also, um, as I should point out, once we wrapped up the main podcast, I did ask Jessa, so who are you reading? And I am sure you want to hear her answer to that. It, it's a riot. Um, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories show in order to do that. And that'll get you access to our monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. You can do that at patreon.com slash vmspod or at paypal.me slash vmspod. There are all sorts of goals and goodies in place for supporters of the show, but primarily that podcast. There's also a patron-only blog, uh, the handwritten show notes for every episode, uh, which is a kind of interesting artifact. I'm going to launch a series of ebooks later this year when my transcription service gets up to speed, and, um, and more, or so I hope. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, this episode was recorded at Jess's home up the Hudson, a bit from New York City. Uh, there were a couple of tolls, but nothing George Washington Bridge-like. Um, oh, I also picked up some coffee afterwards while Amy was getting a tarot reading. Now, if you want to help defray some of the costs of doing the virtual memory show, like the web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, uh, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Paul W. Jones, Kevin Katila, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Zach Martin, Craig P. Steffen, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We've got the full list of show supporters at ChimeraObscura.com slash VM. Now, our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. David's working on a reunion project with his great 80s band, David and David, the other David being David Ricketts. Uh, you can find out more and support that at Facebook.com slash David and David Music. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week, but I'm not sure who our guest is going to be. I've got episodes recorded with uh, Princeton English literature professor Jeff Nonakawa and debut novelist Tony Tula, Tula Temute. I always screw that up. Uh, but it's possible next week's guest will actually be Barbara Epler, the publisher and editor-in-chief of New Directions. You'll have to come back to find out. Till next time, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store or at soundcloud.com slash vmspod. You can also find all our episodes and get in our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. On Facebook at facebook.com slash virtual memories show and at virtual memories podcast dot tumblr dot com. And if you like this show, please. 
go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for this podcast. That'll tell Apple that people are out there listening and maybe help us build a bigger audience. Until next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. Thank you.